<laughs> so, as you all know, my name is Sam Balzac, uh, and I thought since tomorrow's the 4th of July, I'd do a little spiel about uh, Independence Day, especially because we've got a couple Canadians here, so, uh, yeah, I thought about that. Um, so this, this uh, pub speak is kind of a two-part thing. So the first part is kind of a general history of the holiday and of the day itself. And the second part is kind of a theoretical uh, exploration of holidays and why we have holidays. So um, I feel like people kind of lose sight of the larger meaning of the 4th of July. Um, lost kind of in the parades and the fireworks. Americans anticipate the day as a celebration, but more for the sake of the celebration itself. Children anticipate another day for candy hoarding, as they do on other holidays like Halloween or Christmas. Adults recognize the spirit of patriotism, but this is often shadowed by a larger feeling of embarrassment of America due to the Iraq War, the Vietnam War, things like that. So instead of starting with the history of the American Revolution, I thought I'd start with some background on Independence Day as a holiday. Celebrations stem from the summer of 1776, when colonists mocked the previous celebrations of King George III's birthday, which included processions and speech making, by holding mock funerals of the king. Um, this was a way of symbolizing the end of monarchy's hold on America and the triumph of liberty. These celebrations include bonfires, concerts, the firing of cannons and muskets, parades, and public readings of the Declaration of Independence. The first commemoration of Independence Day occurred on July 4th, 1777. Massachusetts made July 4th an official state holiday in 1781. This all took place before the end of the war, so, I mean, it's kind of a before the fact thing. Oh, let's celebrate Independence Day. Yeah, well, yeah. Uh, <laughs> Uh, patriotic celebrations found a larger audience after the War of 1812, having been aroused by a nationalistic spirit during the war. Um, Congress made July 4th a federal holiday in 1870 and established an Independence Day grant paid to all federal employees in 1941. Since the two world wars, Independence Day has become less significant, I think basically this occurred during the 1960s when there was sort of a disillusionment with America based on the Vietnam War and kind of this young generation um, that questioned authority. Um, the firing of cannons and muskets has been replaced by fireworks and outdoor barbecues. So uh, now that there was a little factual information on the holiday's history, kind of dry. Uh, we should now take a look at the date itself. On July 4th, 1776, the Second Continental Congress officially adopted a, dec a declaration written by Thomas Jefferson. Uh, and this declaration asserted that the United States of America was an independent country from Great Britain. Um, here's uh, kind of a fun fact. Uh, the declaration was uh, approved on July 2nd, so John Adams who was on the committee and was the second president of the United States, he thought that July 2nd would actually become the national holiday that people would celebrate. Um, the celebration of the 4th of July is undoubtedly a national phenomenon, therefore, <coughs> seemingly exclusive to Americans, and more specifically Americans who accept a sense of patriotism. If this is true, then the American Independence Day is no different from any other country's private national holiday. And yet, I feel like I'm not alone in feeling like the 4th of July has larger significance than um, some other national holidays in other countries, and at least a larger significance than a lot of people give it credit for. This is sort of a difficult discussion to breach due to a national bias towards the American Independence Day as a patriotic American. Yet, it can be asserted that the Declaration of Independence signifies an enormous symbolic change, if not a literal change, in human consciousness. All men are created equal. What does this mean to society? If all men are equal, then any class system, or at least any class system based on inheritance, is unfair. How can all people begin with equal opportunity when one man is born into propriety and another into poverty? This is certainly not to say that the Declaration brought about such equality in a political sense, and the early American political system did not even begin to approach this in a social sense. The Constitution guaranteed the vote only to white male property owners. The class system was somewhat affected by the diaspora of loyalists following the revolution. 
um, which depleted the wealthy class and thus began to blur the lines of other classes. But there was nothing in the political system to encourage a redistribution of wealth. And had there been such an idea, the young government would certainly have collapsed. African Americans would not gain their freedom in America for almost a century. Women would endure still longer before obtaining the right to vote. Almost two centuries would pass before African Americans would obtain complete political equality. Today's class system is certainly more fluid in the rags to riches sense, but it maintains the sense of inherited wealth and threatens to move in more extreme directions with the present thinning of the middle class. The Founding Fathers clearly did not create the ideal political system of freedom and equality in the, in the Declaration of Independence. They did what they had to do to establish a long-lasting government. The appeal of the Declaration lies solely in its ideas and its ability to threaten the preconceived notions of politics. So let's take a little historical perspective of these notions. After the democracy and republican political systems created by the Greeks and Romans, the world fell prey to the Middle Ages. Here, political authority was basically dominated by the church. Then, as the church splintered and declined, Europe came under control of autocracy, and this was the system uh, when American independence occurred. Granted, Britain had made some strides towards a democratic state in the English Bill of Rights, but such a document maintained the autocratic authority of the king. The American Revolution precipitated a government based not on a religious or autocratic authority, but the authority of the people. The idea of man as an individual, and therefore an entity capable of handling his own destiny, was a cultural aspect of the Enlightenment and thinkers like Locke, Rousseau, Montesquieu, and Voltaire, who consequentially were all important in the development of the American political system. Um, the American Constitution became the political arm of this intellectual movement, just as Russian communism was intended to be the political arm of Marxist ideals. This brings us to a major point. The American Revolution and successive democratic experiment worked. The Declaration of Independence was not a fleeting ideal of society. The, base, uh, the basis of a flawed political system that would quickly collapse and begin a succession of unstable governments. Instead, the ideals of the Declaration became the far-reaching goal of the lasting American political system. The American Revolution is starkly different from any other nation's political evolution. It was both violent or immediate and successful. For example, Great Britain carried out a successful transformation of autocratic to democratic politics. But this system slowly evolved over the course of time. On the other side of the spectrum are the very bloody and very immediate revolutions in France, Latin America, Russia. Um, these revolutions were the ones that precipitated unstable governments. In Latin America, you have dictators like Fidel Castro. In France, you have the reign of terror to Napoleon. In Russia, you've got Lenin and Stalin. These revolutions were, uh, America, on the other hand, implemented swift political change by fighting a war with Britain and followed with the first, uh, first an unsuccessful, but then a successful stable form of government, starting with the Articles, Articles of Confederation and then creating the Constitution. I think that this may be why fireworks are such an important aspect of independent state. The deafening sounds of bright explosive images are reminiscent of cannons and explosions. Americans can sort of justify the glorification of war, at least the American Revolution, in the fact that the conflict was successful and seems to signify the dawning of a new age of man after a necessary conflict. In a way, this kind of reminds me of the, the Christian tradition of celebrating Jesus' suffering as a painful but necessary event for the sake of mankind. Such conflict cannot be celebrated with regards to the French Revolution, for example, because instead of a clear and meaningful result, the revolution signifies a muddled and fearful period of mass murder. I'd like to return to the idea of a connection between fireworks and war later, because that idea got me thinking about the underlying meaning of holidays in general. Christmas, for example, is a holiday with layers and layers of historical significance. On the surface, it's a commercial holiday and a time for generosity. Dig a little deeper and it's a religious celebration of the birth of Christ. Dig still deeper and the holiday finds its roots in the ancient rituals of the Romans, the Yuletide celebrations which acknowledge the end of the old year and the beginning of the new. So what does this tell us about holidays? <coughs> Professor Diane Ashton, the, founder, uh, the founding director of the American Studies program at Rowan University, describes holidays as rituals that break up the monotony of our lives, giving us something that connects us with those we love and with a greater community of Americans. This is certainly true. And here's where one may find legitimacy in the celebratory spirit that people exhibit during holidays. 
even if they have lost touch with the holiday's national or religious significance. Here is where we begin to delve into the theoretical. One must ask, what is it that connects us to uh, connects us with others on holidays like Independence Day? Nationalistic spirit is one answer. Uh, just as spiritual beliefs is an answer for Easter significance, or the benevolence of man has become an answer for Christmas. But is there a deeper sense of what holiday means to us as a race, an underlying truth about the human condition and the universe that connects these very individual holidays together? Ashton also defines holidays as rituals. When I think of a ritual, I think of ancient Mayans and Aztecs celebrating the power of their mystical gods through sacrifice. This feels like a barbarous connection to make as compared to our quaint parades and Christmas trees. But then again, Christmas celebration, Christians celebrate Jesus um, in an essentially symbolic form of cannibalism, by eating his body, bread, and drinking his blood wine. Similarly, the fireworks on Independence Day seem to glorify war, which in one sense enhances the meaning of the holiday, but is still undeniably a celebration of the shedding of blood. These more violent concepts seem very pagan by nature, suggesting that by celebrating holidays, we are indulging in some sort of primitive emotion. There is another important aspect of early civilization that I'd like to throw into the equation, and that is the idea of calendars um, or cycles. Time cycles are unavoidable in society. You know, the Earth rotates day and night, uh, the moon revolves around the Earth, and we've got months. It's a very scientific-based phenomenon, so it really is something we have to deal with as humans. It's not something that we create on our own. In the ancient mind calendar, cycles are used to represent the attempts of the gods to create perfect life forms, only to realize that their life forms are flawed and they must scrap their work and begin again. Examples include the mud people and the wood people, as both of these species proved imperfect and were destroyed by the gods. This is supposedly why December 21st or 23rd of 2012 is such a fearful day because it could represent the destruction of humans or the corn people as imperfect individuals to be replaced with another intelligent species. The overlying idea of the mind calendar and of cycles is this idea that, first off, history continuously repeats itself. The gods create intelligent beings. Those beings turn out to be imperfect. The gods destroy those beings and create new ones, etc. The second part of this idea is that although the Mayan gods know that their efforts to create the perfect species will follow the same cycle of failure, they continually introduce new species and refuse to give up. I believe that such ideas are relatable to holidays. Because life appears to be shaped by continuous cycles, holidays are simply high, uh, highlighted points of this cycle that, we're, that uh, where change may or may not occur, just as December of 2012 is supposed to mark such a change. Take New Year's, for example. The same holiday occurs every year, and yet every year individuals think up some new aspect of their lives that they want to purify. Another cyclic event, Lent, involves giving up something material for the same goal of purifying the spirit. These examples are placeholders in a repeating cycle in which change may occur in small steps towards an unreachable ideal. This brought me back to the fireworks and their representation of cannons and bloody revolution. I have already spoken a little about the celebration of the American Revolution as a necessary conflict that initiated the symbolic new age of democracy and freedom for the individual. Yet, we know that the government created after the revolution was flawed, and therefore we cannot celebrate the 4th of July as coming into the ideal. By simulating war through firework displays and arousing the national spirit, I think that Independence Day acts as a parallel to the original Independence Day, and indeed all succeeding Independence Days. After all, the holiday is but one day in a repeating cycle, and therefore must repeat itself. In that moment when the silence of the night is broken by that first firework, a simulation occurs in which Americans again experience the shock around the world. We, over two centuries beyond the American Revolution, therefore witness and experience the conflict that our founding, uh, founding fathers witnessed and experienced. In that moment of conflict preceding the democratic goal, Americans should suddenly feel a reinvigoration in the ideal of democracy. In a sense, by re-experiencing Independence Day as a symbolic struggle for the democratic ideal, Americans are trying once again to reach that ideal in a similar way as the ancient Mayan gods once again trying to create the ideal individual. So, here's a little song. July 4th is not a holiday that should be exclusively American or celebrated only by patriotic Americans. Independence Day symbolizing the, uh, symbolizes the dawning of the new political age of democracy after a relatively short struggle with autocracy. 
Independence Day is best suited for this because it symbolizes an immediate conflict, unlike the British evolution from autocracy to democracy, and because it initiated an effective political system true to the conflict's goals, unlike the French or Russian revolutions, which suffered from some form of dictatorship. Furthermore, holidays in general may represent a moment when man finds himself in parallel with a significant moment in the past. And therefore, Independence Day could represent man's transportation back into the struggle of democracy, and therefore might bring us closer to the democratic idea. So, uh, first of all, great speech. Um, I guess my question would be, you, meant, you argued that the French should not celebrate the French Revolution because it didn't bring about change, it just brought around a bloody reign of terror that eventually generated dictatorship under Napoleon. Yet, as we all know, the French do celebrate Bastille Day. Why do you think, in your opinion, they do celebrate it then? Um, I think I think it may be a little unfair to say that the revolution didn't precipitate anything, but you know, eventually um, France did, you know, become a republic and has president and stuff. So I think that Every country sort of needs to have that moment where they celebrate the, um, the rejection of autocracy and becoming a democracy, even if there isn't like a specific moment that happens. <coughs> like, even, even the American Revolution, July 4th isn't a definite moment when, oh, we're going to reject autocracy and we're going to have democracy. You know, it kind of spans from everything from the shock of the world to the creation of the Constitution in that, you know, Americans initially didn't really want to break with Great Britain and, you know, they sort of evolved into the sense that <coughs> they wanted this new democratic spirit to happen. Okay, um, also, great job, I thoroughly enjoyed it. I just have a question, do you think that, like, the democratic ideal of, like, I feel like democracy asks of us um, think of everybody that it, like lives under this constitution or whatever as your equal, so that you may vote alongside them, so that you may do all these things as like a unit. I don't know if that makes any sense, but um, but do you think that ideal is truly being upheld? I mean, like, gay people still can't get married. Like, that's not. I mean, that's not. So like, so do you think that those ideals are in fact being upheld? Well, I don't think that the democratic system that we have is idyllic. And I think that's kind of, in a sense, why we, why we you know, feel this parallel to the past and that we're, trying, we're ever trying to reach that. <coughs> and I think that's sort of the idea in the Constitution created by you know, the amendment system, where they recognize, and that's kind of the brilliance of the Constitution, is that they recognize that they're not creating a perfect democratic society and that future generations will have to sort of manipulate the government in order to establish um, more of an evolution towards that idea, I guess. And I think, to some extent, that is happening. Like, we're never going to reach that idea. I, you know, humans are perfect. Uh, but as far as, like, the gay marriage issue, I think that is starting to happen. Like, Obama recently came out in favor of gay marriage. And, you know, New York, <laughs> So there is a pretty commonly held view among historians that the American Revolution is actually pretty conservative in nature and that it really caused the dramatic changes and who was actually controlling like, what was happening in America. Do you think that at all like problematizes your view of that's all right? You know, I don't think so, because I think it really is a symbol. It's more of a mindset than a, than a reality. You know, I mean, the, the class system and, the and stuff like that. It wasn't like immediately, oh, now we have democracy, and I'm going to go, right? You know, um, but I think it does represent a rejection of autocracy and sort of the recognition that Eventually, we do want a state where everybody is equal. You know, all men are created equal is sort of, I think, kind of a hope. It's sort of a, a goal to reach for, in a sense. I 
don't know if that makes sense. So, I guess. Does that kind of answer your question? Or? Sort of. I guess I follow up. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it doesn't. Uh, or is it just really about the ideal and less about the actual thing I think it's about the ideal, and I think it's about, it's more about the struggle towards the ideal than the ideal itself. Um, I guess. Um, this might be a bit of a loaded question, but what do you think is the significance of the fact that a lot of the holidays we celebrate not just in America, but around the world in general, seem to revolve around the kind of sorry, celebration or emulation of a of a originally blood or kind of more um, you know not a positive experience, but we end up um, making it positive through our celebrations and kind of really changes. Like, what do you think is the significance that we take a you know the reference? Sacrificing and as technical, and you know, the blame is a war. We celebrate that and we kind of convert it into something. That's a really, really good question. And I think it kind of comes back to this idea. Um, I think it's, is it Buddhism that says that uh, life is suffering and suffering is sort of a uh, means of. Uh, but you know, it has to do with this idea of suffering, and that suffering is part of life. And <coughs> I think, as humans, we recognize that by um, having these sort of symbolic rituals. Like, as far as um, evolution goes, we've come to the point where we respect this idea that, you know, bloodshed is wrong to an extent. So, we celebrate it more as a symbolic thing, I think, now, I guess. Is that good to celebrate even symbolic, um, symbolic, to celebrate symbolically the murder of humans for more gold than my government? I don't really know. I mean, is that, is that a great question? No, yeah, yeah, that's, Sorry. A, that's, a really, that's a really, really good question. And I know that's kind of what people say in the middle. Yeah, it's it's an interesting thing to think about. I'll have to get back.